In 2010, the Minnesota Twins celebrated their golden anniversary with their eyes on the future in the newest wonder of the baseball world. And as Target Field opened up, the Twins celebrated their very memorable past by honoring the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins. Join us now for Chapter 2 as we celebrate the men who turned the Metrodome into the Thunderdome. <laughs> In 1961, when the Washington Senators were reborn as the Minnesota Twins, the Upper Midwest quickly embraced a new set of heroes. 400 Major League Homer for Harvey. In the 50 years since, for the generations that followed, the faces changed and the venues did too. There were Frosty Malts, Homer Hankies, and now the splendor of Target Field. And through it all, men who played the game found a special place in Twins territory. Individually, they were Hall of Famers and MVPs, batting champions, and homegrown stars who lit up the hometown stage. Collectively, they form an elite group, and their achievements are celebrated as we honor the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins on Fox Sports North. Hi everyone, I'm Dick Bramer, here at Target Field, where the inaugural season at this spectacular new ballpark coincided with the Twins celebrating their 50th anniversary. As part of the festivities, the organization honored the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins, players and managers selected by a panel of voters who have followed the team over the course of their 50 seasons in Twins territory. Here on Fox Sports North, the best of the best had their stories written and narrated by a wide variety of professionals, from former teammates and media members to the current manager of the Twins. For the next hour, we'll celebrate players who made their mark at the Metrodome, where the Homer Hankies flew and the Thunderdome rocked. And we'll start with the players who took the Twins from worst to first. Now the set, the pitch to Herbeck. Fastball swung, a long drive. Center field, way back, way back. It is a grand a kid grows up idolizing the local nine, wearing the local hero's number and the team's cap and colors, and dreaming of playing in the ballpark where he spends summer nights with his father. It's such a routine dream that we forget how infrequently it bears fruit. Before Paul Molitor returned to his hometown team to smack his 3,000th hit, and Joe Maurer caught the first pitch at Target Field, Kent Herbeck became the first Minnesota kid to graduate from practicing his swing in his parents' basement in the dead of a Minnesota winter to starring for his Minnesota Twins. And while Molitor made it to the Hall of Fame and Maurer became perhaps the most popular player in franchise history, Herbeck, between beers, brats, and maybe even the occasional cigarette butt, might tell you that he's the guy with the two rings. A bouncing ball of God, he has it. Close to Herbeck, and the Twins are baseball's world champion. The world champion, Minnesota Twins. Without wasting much time in the gym, Herbeck became our classic old-time, old-school ball player. A guy who would accompany Bob Casey's announcements before the games. That's right, no smoking in the Metrodome. But Herbie knew where you could find a beer and then go out and win the game with a homer or a scoop or maybe even a pro wrestling Here's move. Gant back to first base and then he's out. His best World Series Gant. moments resonate and of course they occurred at home. He hit a grand slam in his Metrodome in 87 and bumped Ron Gant halfway to Bloomington in 91 and celebrated like he'd been dreaming of showering his twins jersey with champagne for years. In fact, he had. Jim Suhan, Minneapolis Star Tribune. To fully appreciate being the best in any endeavor, you have to first endure failure. Gary Gaetti was part of a twins nucleus that would, in short order, transform itself from the game's worst to the game's best. 
In Gaetti's first full year, 1982, we had our worst season ever, losing 102 games. Affectionately known as the Rat, Gary hit only 230 and was error prone at third base. Five years later, Gary was the top run producer for our world championship team. He also became the best fielding third baseman in the league. Others may have gotten more headlines, but it was Gary who served as the backbone of our emerging team. Asked by a reporter, who could lead the underdog twins over the heavily favored Tigers in the 1987 ALCS? Gary shot back a steely glare and said, who do you think? He then proceeded to become the first man to hit home runs in his first two postseason at bats on his way to winning the ALCS MVP. Our first World Series title ended fittingly with a ground ball to the unnamed captain of the 1987 the world champion, Minnesota Twins. And the Twins are baseball's world champion. The world champion, Minnesota Twins. Mickey grounding the guy. Dick Bramer, Fox Sports North. He was the California kid, a former number one pick of the Angels, who joined the Twins a month into the first season in the Metrodome and made an immediate impact, fitting right into the young nucleus that eventually won Minnesota's first world championship. With a bushy mustache and a name that was nickname ready for a power hitter, Bruno lasted at least 20 home runs in each of his six seasons in Minnesota and led the Twins in home runs three times. But Bruno was no one-dimensional player. Surprisingly nimble for a man his size, Bruno ran the bases and covered right field with an aggressive style that made him a fan favorite. And his fundamentally sound game helped form the blueprint for playing the game the Twins way. Bernanski's finest moment came when the Twins needed it most as he hit 412 with a pair of home runs as the Twins upset the mighty Detroit Tigers in the 1987 ALCS. Two weeks later, Bruno and his teammates were world champions, and the California kid has secured his place in Minnesota history. Patrick Donnelly, FoxSportsNorth.com. He was a shortstop on both Twins World Championship teams, and he was a true unsung hero in those postseasons of 1987 and 1991. Greg Gagne wasn't the dominant hitter, wasn't the flashy fielder, wasn't an all-star or a gold glover, but few teams go all the way without a good shortstop, and Greg Gagne was that and more during his 10 seasons in the Twins uniform. Gagne hits a fly ball to deep left field, way back, way back. It is a home run for Greg Gagne. In the 24 ALCS and World Series games in 1987 and 1991, Gagne had four big home runs and five doubles among his 19 hits, scored 12 runs, and drove in 10 more. Defensively, he did not make an error in the 12 postseason games played in the Metrodome. He was rock solid and often was unnoticed until he ran the bases. Although he was not a proficient base dealer, there was no twin better at going from first to third or turning a double into a triple. And this is going to be an inside the park home run. Here comes Gagne. And there were his three inside the park home runs tying for the most in club history including being the only twin to have two in a game. Steady and solid and an exciting base runner, that was Greg Gagne, one of the best shortstops to wear a Twins uniform. Greg Wong, St. Paul Pioneer Press.
Frank Viola was the Twins' number two draft pick in 1981 out of St. John's University, where he was an All-American. He started only 23 minor league games before getting called up the following spring. Along with Viola, the class of 1982 featured fellow rookies such as Ken Herbeck, Tom Bernanski, and Gary Gaetti, a group that would be the nucleus of the organization's revitalization. Frankie was known for his superstitions like eating pasta before every start and for his outgoing personality and high-pitched laugh. On the mound, he had the game's best changeup, and his dominance earned him the nickname Sweet Music. In eight seasons in Minnesota, Frank won 112 games, 17 of those in 1987 when he led the Twins to a division title. Viola was great in the regular season and divine in the playoffs. He bested the Cardinals in games one and seven of the Fall Classic and was named MVP of the World Series. 87 was a year of team triumph, but 1988 was filled with individual honors. Viola won 24 games, and was baseball's best pitcher. He became only the second twin to win the signing award. Bart Blylevin, former teammate, twins analyst. You're watching the 50 greatest Minnesota twins on Fox Sports North. The 50 Greatest Twins on Fox Sports North is brought to you by McDonald's. Hot chocolates and hot mochas are the perfect chocolate treat. By carsoup.com. By Research Cell. By Quick Trip, home of the no-fee ATM. And by Arby's, home of the new value menu starting at just $1. Since 1987, the closer's role for the Twins has been highlighted by world champions, all-stars, and players who have set and then reset the team record for saves in a season. As the list of the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins moves to the bullpen, we begin with the man who has been there the longest, Coach Rick Stelmazek. Three decades, spend any time around the Twins, and you know Stell. Real name, Rick Stelmazek, former big league catcher. But to the Twins family, he is simply Stell, and he is the last link. The man who spans generations that created Twins baseball. He started as a Class A manager in the late 70s, where he broke in Ken Herbeck and Gary Gaetti. By 1981, he was a Twins coach helping develop the young core that would win a World Series in 1987. Stelly was the organizer, the man Tom Kelly entrusted with the planning for every spring training. And Stelly was always the conscience of the team. When something needed to be said, when someone needed an adjustment, Stelly could deliver in his patented South Side Chicago tone. And players listened. In his 30th season with the team, he is the guardian of Twins baseball, the man who ensures that every twin respects the game and the uniform. The last uniformed link to Herbie, G-Man, Puck, Bruno, and Frankie. He is Stelly, a Twins treasure. Ted Robinson, former Twins broadcaster. As an all-star for the Montreal Expos, Jeff Reardon became known as a Terminator. In Minnesota, he became the final piece of a championship puzzle. In the mid-80s, the yield from the Twins farm system was a bumper crop, but the blown save had become more than a bad habit. It invaded the psyche as ninth inning leads often brought a sense of impending doom. Acquired in February of 1987, Reardon's bushy black beard and crackling fastball made for a menacing combination. And he was matter of fact about his business on the mound. Here it is, he seemed to say, hit it if you can. 
Her strike three called a breaking ball and they got him looking. In his 31 saves, they couldn't as the Twins reached the postseason for the first time since 1970. And when Tom Kelly gave him the ball with a ninth inning lead in game seven of the 87 World Series, that sense of impending doom was long gone, ended by the Terminator. And the Twins are baseball's world champions. The world champion, Minnesota Twins. All hip, Fox Sports North. Rick Aguilera arrived as one of five pitchers acquired in a trade deadline deal that sent the reigning American League Cy Young Award winner Frank Viola to the New York Mets in 1989. He came as an accomplished starting pitcher, having won 31 games in three seasons as a Mets fifth starter. Aggie was moved into the closer role prior to the 1990 campaign. It was a perfect fit for a guy whose body and demeanor did not follow the norm for modern closers. Despite his less than intimidating physical appearance, he saved 32 games for a last place club in 1990. The next year was even better when he set a franchise record with 42 saves, helping the Twins achieve a worst to first world championship. Aguilera recorded five postseason saves and a victory in the Twins' dramatic win in Game 6 of the World Series, when Kirby Puckett's 11th inning blast made sure the Twins would play again tomorrow night. Aggie was a three-time All-Star, and his 254 saves are the most ever by a Twins pitcher. Anthony LaPanta, Fox Sports North. Some relievers have had great fastballs. Eddie Guardado did not. Some had other nasty pitches. Guardado's slider was good, far from great. Some looked scary on the mound. You had to stifle your lap when Guardado tried to look mean. But if you were in a foxhole, you wanted every day Eddie with you. Guardado had guts. He took his 91 mile an hour fastball and slider and dared opponents to hit him. He would pitch in on their hands, or make them chase something down and away. He would pitch in four straight games or five games in seven days if he had to. It made him reliable and a fan favorite. And the Twins take the first two against Chicago. Rodato led the league with 83 appearances in 1996, earning the everyday nickname and becoming one of the great setup men in the game. When the Twins needed a closer during the 2001 season, Eddie jumped at the chance. A year later, he led the AL with 45 saves and ended up with 187 saves in his career. It was a career crafted on mentality as much as talent, because even he said, all I have is guts. If you take my guts away from me, I've got nothing. Lavelle Nil, Minneapolis Star Trek. Less than a year into his professional baseball career, Joe Nathan faced a life-changing decision. The six-foot-four prospect had been drafted by the Giants as a shortstop, but after struggling in his first minor league stop, Nathan was told that his future didn't lie in the field, but rather on the mound. Unsure of just what such a change might do for his career, Nathan made a drastic choice. He left the game. After taking a year off to finish his degree at the University of Stony Brook, Nathan returned to the Giants organization in 1997 and developed into a quality pitching prospect. Yet it wasn't until seven years later, after he arrived in Minnesota in perhaps one of the greatest trades in club history and was slotted into the closer role, that Nathan's all-star career really took off. Nathan saves a big ball game for the Twins in Seattle. Despite only one career save to Nathan's name at the time of the trade, opponents quickly began to fear the lanky punch-out pitcher thanks to his sinking fastball 
biting slider, and 12-6 curveball. Nathan is just the second closer in baseball history to record 36 or more saves in six consecutive seasons, and along the way, he secured his place as one of the elite closers in the game. Kelly Thaser, MLB.com. You're watching the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins on Fox Sports North. Five seasons from 1987 to 1991, the Minnesota Twins took us to the promised land twice. And each time, the cast of characters was a little different, but there was a constant as well. The pair of world championships were built on playing baseball the Twins way. Tom Kelly was about respect. Respect for your teammates. Respect the coaches and staff. More than anything, respect the game. TK demanded that everyone, from the superstar to the 25th man, play the game properly. On that, he did not compromise. The result? two world championships. TK said little, but missed nothing. A strong game manager, but a shrewd judge of people. He loved veterans, but identified with the bench player he had been in his career. He conquered the manager's toughest job, handling pitchers. No one was better at handling a bullpen. But Tom Kelly's legacy goes beyond two World Series. The Twins still play sound fundamental baseball every game. To this day, the hallmark of this franchise. And it started with Tom Kelly. Ted Robinson, former Twins broadcaster. Championship teams invariably exhibit a tenacity that almost defies defeat. No wonder, then, that Dan Gladden won two World Series titles as a Minnesota Twin. The Twins may have never had a more intense player in their 50-year history. Gladden came to the Twins just prior to the 1987 season and brought with him intangibles that can't be measured with a number or statistic. He played with a fire and attitude that spread across the field and through the clubhouse. Determined to the point of being defiant, Gladden played the game with a controlled rage, a flair that sparked two of the most remarkable one-season turnarounds in Major League history. We were a last-place team in 1986, and then we won it all in 1987. In 1990, we finished seventh again only to win our second World Series title in five years. It was ironic that a man who was so focused on the field that he never smiled, made the most joyous 90-foot run in Twins history, his last appearance in a Twins uniform. Gladden scores, and once again, the Minnesota Twins are baseball's world champions. Dick Bramer, Fox Sports North. Has there ever been a twin who worked harder than Gene Larkin? A 20th round draft pick, he made himself a major leaguer. First by learning to switch hit, then by switching to the outfield when first base belonged to Kent Herbeck. Gene built a gym in his home and became one of the first players to dedicate himself to natural strength training. His seven years in a twin's uniform were distilled to one swing. In the moment every player awaits, the chance to be a hero. Game 7 of the 1991 World Series, Gene thought that moment had passed him by in the ninth inning. 
But when destiny called him in the 10th inning of a scoreless game, he needed just one pitch to end the greatest game in Twins history. Oh, there it is, a long fly ball into left center field for Gene Larkin. With a swing of dreams. Ted Robinson, former Twins broadcaster. Chuck Knobloch stepped to the plate, he generated excitement. A tough and talented Texan, Knobloch kept a calm, confident demeanor in the batter's box, even though the rest of his body was a beehive of activity. From the fidgeting with his batting gloves to his distinctive stance, Knobloch's routine made him a backyard legend, impersonated by kids all across Twins territory. Chuck was the Twins' first round pick in 1989 and was fast-tracked to the big leagues. In 1991, he stepped in to fill a pair of glaring holes, the job at second base, and the second slot in the batting order. He performed beyond expectations, earning Rookie of the Year honors. His play was a primary reason for the Twins' worst-to-first turnaround. Knobloch won his first of four rings with the Twins in 1991, and in his seven years in Minnesota, he became the team's all-time stolen base leader, a gold glove winner, and a four-time All-Star. Trevor Fleck, Fox Sports North. Midway through the 1989 season, the Twins sent reigning American League Cy Young Award winner Frank Viola to the New York Mets in exchange for five pitchers. One of those was Kevin Tappany, who had made his big league debut just weeks earlier. Tappany quickly became a dependable arm in the middle of the rotation. In 1991, as the Twins rolled to 95 wins in a division title, Tappany rebounded from a 2-6 and six start and went 14-3 and three the rest of the way, including a masterful nine-game winning streak in July and August. He was the starting pitcher in the clinching Game 5 against Toronto in the ALCS, and a week later was given the ball in Game 2 of the World Series. He outdueled Braves ace Tom Glavin that night, allowing just two runs in eight innings as the Twins grabbed a two-game-to-none lead with a 3-2 win. Tappany was a control pitcher in every sense of the word. In 1990 and 91, only one pitcher walked fewer batters per nine innings. Former teammates describe him as a guy who got the absolute maximum from his ability and a pitcher who executed a game plan as well as anybody in the league. Anthony LaPanta, Fox Sports North. You're watching the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins on Fox Sports North. The 50 greatest Minnesota Twins hail from the U.S., Canada, and across the seas. But a few of them became home state heroes. A kid from Bloomington, another from Rothsay, and four players who learned the game in the capital city of St. Paul. Jack Morris spent one season with the Minnesota Twins. That year will be remembered for lifetimes. He was already a star when he decided to finally pitch for his hometown team. No one wanted him more than Tom Kelly, who named Jack the horse, and Morris embraced the role. He led the staff through actions, first to the park, first to work every drill, last to one out of a ball game. He led the staff in innings, and he won 18 games that year, crucial to a division championship. Jack was great for the Twins pitchers, and the Twins were great for Jack. He was known as Moody, but that died quickly in the Twins' superb clubhouse. 
Jack wanted only one thing, and that was to win. Winning consumed him, as the world saw in October. He won three times, then came game seven, the game that would be Jack's destiny. One singular game that defined a winner. Jack refused to allow a run to leave the game, and finally, he refused to lose. As long as Jack took a breath, the Braves were not going to score. Fate brought Jack Morris and the Twins together for one unforgettable season and one of the greatest games ever played. Every time someone looks at their 1991 World Series ring, they know to thank Jack Morris. Ted Robinson, former Twins broadcaster. Winfield was one of the greatest athletes to ever play the game. He was long and lean with a torrid swing and stride so powerful it couldn't contain his famous no-eared helmet. He possessed both a menacing glare and a smile that could light up the entire ballpark. Born and raised in St. Paul, Winfield was a star at Central High School and played both baseball and basketball for the Gophers. He pursued baseball and went straight to the show. His Hall of Fame career included 12 All-Star appearances, 7 Gold Gloves, and a World Series title. Dave's 22 big league seasons included two back home. Though his stay in Minnesota was short, it is where he made history. Trevor Fleck, Fox Sports North. As a child, Paul Molitor displaced a few tons of dirt on the playgrounds of St. Paul. Faster than a Minnesota summer and just as variable, Molitor excelled in baseball, basketball, and soccer, but baseball proved to be his enduring love and vocation. He started at Creighton High, then the University of Minnesota, then in Milwaukee and Toronto before finishing his career with the Minnesota Twins. He became an all-star with the Brewers. He became champion with the Blue Jays. He became an immortal with the Twins. As a youngster, he moved constantly at the plate. As he matured, he quieted and honed his swing, making it simple and as reliable as a metronome. He'd stand frozen at the plate, his black bat resting lightly on his shoulder, and wait until the last possible moment to lash out at the ball. On September 16, 1996, that swing produced the 3,000th hit of his career. hit that made him the first ballot Hall of Famer. On a cool night in Kansas City, Molitor lashed a drive to right center and became the first player ever to reach 3,000 with a triple, sliding face first into third base and into history. Jim Suhan, Minneapolis Star Tribune. When Joe Maurer was four, we shot a homemade, old-school video of one of his t-ball games. He walked to the plate, assumed his now-familiar stance, whacked the ball, and took off running. It was a smaller version of big league Joe Maurer, just add sideburns, trophies, and fame. Liner to left base hit! Two for three for Maurer! That should have about clinch it right there for Joe Maurer. In 2006, he became the first American League catcher to win a batting title. Then he did it twice more. He's won gold gloves, silver sluggers, and the MVP award. And this year his popularity culminated with him becoming the leading vote getter for the 2010 All-Star Game. Joe honed his now famous swing in our backyard on Lexington Parkway and in our basement and with his brothers on the St. Paul Sandlots. He didn't say much then and he doesn't say much now, 
but his brother Billy remembers making his little brother angry once. Joe chased him into the upstairs bathroom and punched through a window. We never see that side of Joe in a batter's box. All we see is his calm exterior and the familiar swoosh of that now famous swing. Jim Suhan, Minneapolis Star Tribune. You're watching the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins on Fox Sports North. Following the 2001 season, the Twins were a decade removed from postseason play and faced with the possibility of contraction. In January of 2002, longtime third base coach Ron Gardenhire became their manager. In the years since, Guardian and the Twins have celebrated six Central Division championships. He's one of the most successful and longest tenured managers in big league baseball. A survivor of a profession known for high blood pressure and high turnover. And yet Ron Gardenhire still hangs out with the same people he befriended when he moved to Minnesota in 1991. Guys named Walleye and Spike, his wife Carol, and now his coaches, including pitching coach Rick Anderson, with whom he dreamed of working on a big league staff when they were fringe players for the Mets in the 1980s. Gardenhire lives in a vortex of second guessing, but his credentials are undeniable. Five division titles and seven winning records in eight seasons for a franchise that has not always provided him with a great depth of talent. He's overseen the rise of Johan Santana from Rule 5 draftee to Cy Young winner. He called Justin Morneau into a meeting in the summer of 2006, and Morneau transformed himself into an American League Most Valuable Player and a team leader. He's part stand-up comic, part father figure, part taskmaster, but mostly he's one of the foremost faces of one of the most successful franchises in baseball. As Gardy might put it, he's the whole package. Jim Suhan, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Brad Radke was the key player on many losing Twins teams, but also a key figure in their revival. During the 2000 season, Radke agreed to a four-year, $36 million contract extension. The Twins were in last place at the time, but had a roster full of developing players. Radke's signing signaled a commitment to keeping good players around, and he saw the move pay off when the Twins won the first of three straight division titles in 2002. When that contract ran out, Radke turned down three years and $30 million from Boston to sign a two-year extension with the Twins. That allowed Radke, one of the game's great control pitchers, to spend all 12 seasons with one club. Brian Radke with a shutout for career win number 100. We were convinced that Radke could throw a strike on the outside corner while blindfolded from the upper deck of the Metrodome. That's how good his control was. Radke can make the greatest power hitters in the game look feeble, thanks to a fantastic changeup that looked just like his fastball before darting away at the last moment. He was a 20-game winner in 1997. In 12 seasons, Radke pitched at least 200 innings in nine of them. In those nine seasons, Radke walked fewer than 30 batters four times. His 148 wins trail only Jim Cott and Burt Blylevin on the Twins' all-time list. He pitched until his shoulder wouldn't let him pitch anymore. He left it all out on the mound, throwing 87-mile-an-hour fastballs to Oakland during a four-inning stint in the 2006 ALDS and what was the final start of his career. The Valley Neal, Minneapolis Star Tribune. When the Minnesota Twins were in the complete rebuilding mode of the late 90s, 
Who would have thought that a native of Manitoba playing volleyball in Boone, Iowa would be one of the cornerstones of that construction? Corey Koski epitomizes the success of the Twins organization as much as any player in recent memory. Twin Scouts saw a raw athlete who was better at hockey and volleyball, but became a ball player through hard work and determination. Koski took thousands of ground balls off the bat of Tom Kelly, Ron Gardenhire and company. And that practice, those drills transformed him into a good Major League third baseman. He looked less like Brooks Robinson and more like Rogi Vachon fielding his position. But his defense was key to three division titles. Corey held a spot in the middle of the lineup throughout the renaissance years of Twins baseball, and he is one of only six Twins to score and drive in at least 100 runs in the same season. More than anything, Corey was a leader. He owned the clubhouse with his distorted Canadian humor and demented practical jokes. That Twins clubhouse was fun, and those teams brought that fun to the field, and they won. In his final season in Minnesota, he was a mentor to a fellow Canadian who would become a league MVP and also make the list of the 50 greatest twins. But the honor of the original Twins Canadian on this list belongs to Corey Koski. were riding a string of eight straight losing seasons when they made Michael Kadire their first round draft pick in 1997 out of Great Bridge High School in Chesapeake, Virginia. A versatile defensive player with a powerful bat, Kadire went through several ups and downs before 2006 when he racked up 109 RBI. He's been among the team's pillars ever since, showing leadership on the field, in the clubhouse, and in the community. His value was made obvious in September 2009 when Justin Morneau suffered a season-ending back injury. Kadire moved from right field to first base and finished with 32 homers as the Twins made a late run for another division title. Only one player has been a part of all five division championships the Twins have won since 2002. It's Michael Kadire. He's been the glue, an invaluable leader on and off the field. Joe Christensen, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Tory Hunter's name can be found around the middle of the top 10 and several career leader lists in the Twins record book, such as runs, hits, doubles, and stolen bases. If there was a category for broken hearts, Hunter would be at the top. Hunter coined the phrase, we're into defense and breaking hearts, and often gave up his body while taking away hits from opponents. There are pieces of his skin still on the Metrodome turf, and he never met a wall he didn't run into. He patrolled the outfield from 1997 till 2007 for the Twins with his speed, arm, and amazing instincts helping him earn seven Gold Glove awards during that time. The most memorable catch of his career came during the 2002 All-Star Game in Milwaukee where he reached over the wall to rob the great Barry Bonds of a homer. He was no slouch at the plate, hitting at least 26 homers in five different seasons. He was a go-to guy for quotes in the clubhouse, and he was the face of the franchise as the Twins rose from the ashes in the late 1990s to become a force in the AL Central in the 2000s. Lavelle Neal, Minneapolis Star Tribune. In December 1999, the Twins made an unusual trade with the Florida Marlins. 
Picking higher in the Rule 5 draft, the Twins agreed to take pitcher Jared Camp so they could swap him for Johan Santana, a little-known left-handed pitcher from Venezuela who was toiling in the Houston Astros system. The Marlins even chipped in the $50,000 it cost the Twins to gain Santana's rights. The Twins had to keep Santana on their big league roster in 2000, and they stuck with him, even though he posted a 6.49 ERA in 30 games. Eventually, those decisions paid big dividends. Santana moved into the rotation in July of 2003 and went 9-2 with a 2.51 ERA down the stretch. And he was arguably the best American League pitcher through 2006, winning two Cy Young Awards. Santana went 93-44 and with a 3.22 ERA in eight seasons with the Twins before they traded him to the Mets in February of 2008. Not a bad return on a $50,000 gamble. Joe Christensen, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Justin Morneau was a catcher when the Twins signed him as a third-round draft pick in 1999 out of New Westminster, British Columbia. The Twins converted him into a first baseman and watched him blossom as a power-hitting prospect. He won three championships on his way through the minors. Farm director Jim Rant said the managers in the system had a standing joke. They said, send the kid Morneau for the playoffs because we want to win a ring. Morneau went through some growing pains after making his Major League debut in 2003, but the breakthrough came in 2006 when he won the American League MVP honors. A five-hit night for Morneau! Besides becoming one of the game's best hitters, Morneau has turned himself into one of the top first basemen. He finished second in the MVP voting in 2008, before having MVP caliber seasons derailed by injuries in 2009 and 2010. He remains a franchise cornerstone who is driven to win the biggest ring yet. Joe Christensen, Minneapolis Star Tribune. You're watching the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins on Fox Sports North. Over the course of two one-hour specials here on Fox Sports North, we've honored 49 of the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins. As we conclude, we do so with perhaps the most popular athlete this region has ever seen, Hall of Famer Kirby Puckett. Gant swings and hits one very high and deep to left center. Back is Puckett. He's at the fence. He leaps up. He caught it. Oh, what a catch. Kirby Puckett. One of the greatest twins ever. is remembered for many incredible feats in his 12 years and over 1,800 regular and postseason games. But one game stands out above the rest, mostly because the stage it was played on. There isn't a longtime twins fan who will forget game six of the 1991 World Series. That night in the Metrodome, Kirby made a leaping catch against the plexiglass in center field to rob Ron Gant of an extra base hit. Puckett swings and hits a blast! Deep left center, way back, way back! It's gone! The Twins go to the seventh game! Then, in the bottom of the 11th inning, Kirby's third hit of the night was a walk-off home run. Only the ninth time a World Series game ended with a home run off the final pitch. And that 4-3 victory allowed the Twins to go on and win the dramatic seventh game the next night. That he would blast a home run of that magnitude wasn't imaginable when he joined the Twins in 1984. As a rookie, Kirby was a slap hitter who often bunted for base hits. In fact, that year he did not hit a home run in 128 games. The next season, he hit four home runs, which planted a seed for what was to come. In spring training in Orlando in 1986, manager Ray Miller and third base coach Tom Kelly 
knew the now stronger Puckett could hit home runs and still hit for a high average. They could see the power he had after developing into a solid line drive hitter under the toolage of hitting coach Tony Oliva. Miller and Kelly told Puckett to try to drive the ball when the count was in his favor, like 2-0, 2-1, and 3-1. Oh, and 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 it was that simple tip that turned the line drive hitter into a slugger. That season, Kirby blasted a career-high 31 home runs and still hit for a high average at 328, the first of his eight plus 300 seasons. When asked during that season for the reason for the sudden transformation from singles hitter to slugger, Kirby always gave credit to Tony Oliva, his hitting coach. I'm just trying to help Tony get into the Hall of Fame. That one sentence speaks volumes of the type of player, friend, and teammate Kirby Puckett was. Tony Oliva is not in the Hall of Fame yet, but if Kirby Puckett were alive today, I bet he will still be working on getting Tony to join him in Cooperstown. Greg Wong, St. Paul Pioneer Press. Over 50 years, they were 50 men who helped take baseball in Twins territory from day one at Metropolitan Stadium, through the Metrodome, and now here to Target Field. I'm Dick Bramer. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the 50 greatest Minnesota Twins.